Okay, so we'll just have everybody's connecting now. So do you, Paul Chair, welcome everyone to another lovely Thursday night. It's kind of wet and damp here in Kerry. And um, I'll just do the basic housekeeping while we're waiting for everybody to join in. There's a couple of familiar names in there as well. It's lovely to see people rejoining us month after month. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping, this event is being recorded, what we do is put an edited version of this on our YouTube channel, and we will email everybody out, it'll be up within a week, and we email out everybody a link to the video and some of John's fantastic notes as well. This is a webinar, so we can't actually see or hear you. Um, but what we would love is if you have any burning questions as the presenters are giving their talks, you can put your questions in the chat and then we're going to do uh, the kind of questions and a chat section at the very end. Um, and if you are putting questions in the chat, just make sure to push to everybody rather than just to panelists, because sometimes we can miss a question there as well. Um, so that's all I need to say. I'm going to hand you over to uh, Steve Liner now. Thanks. First on mute helps. Um, good evening, folks, and uh, welcome to uh, our session for February. Um, you join us uh, I'm in South Kerry, a very wet, uh, miserable South Kerry at the moment. Um, which is unfortunate as uh, we just had a new moon the other day. So uh, we were kind of hoping that this weekend we might get uh, to see uh, some of the really nice things that are up in the sky that John's going to talk about. Um, we will uh, start off uh, as usual with uh, John Flannery from the Irish Astronomical Society. John uh, uh, has uh, done these sessions with us now since June and um, his input on what to what to see when the sky is clear is uh, always very welcome. John, hand over to you. Thank, thanks very much, Steve. And I, I'm afraid I, I can hear the rain outside the window here in Dublin as well. Um, but they are forecasting it to clear just after midnight. And um, I. I just have that first slide up. That's from uh, July 2020 when a couple of us from the beach near uh, Gormanstown in North County Dublin um, basically stayed up from dusk till dawn um, observing when Comet Neowise was around at that time, but also in the early hours of the morning, there was an opportunity to see all of the eight major planets. If, if you discount Pluto as a planet, but I won't get into that debate tonight, but we managed to succeed doing that. Um, all were visible in binoculars, in fact, um, even the planet Neptune, which is the furthest out and the dimmest of the eight major planets. And, Mick McQuarrie, one of my club colleagues, is there just observing Venus above the cloud tops. And shortly after that, Mercury popped up over the horizon. And that, that was the eighth object to observe. Well, there's seven planets um, in the sky. And then if you look down at the ground, you get the eighth planet, the one we're on ourselves, the Earth. But this week, um, there was a bit of uh, anticipation over the fact that um, the sun basically um, threw off what's called a coronal mass ejection. And the graphic on the right hand side, you can see um, a kind of faint bubble of gas being belched out by the sun. And that's a cloud of charged particles that was basically fired earthward and when it encounters our magnetic field um, it's those particles are channeled towards the south and north magnetic poles spiral into the upper atmosphere and excite the atoms of the gases in the atmosphere to glow and give us the northern and southern lights 
the view you're seeing there is actually from a spacecraft called SOHO or the Solar Heliospheric Obs Observatory. It's about 1.2 million kilometers closer to the sun than the earth. It, it follows the earth around the sun, but is in a stable orbit, what's called uh, Lagrangian point. That term cropped up a lot in December because the James Webb Space Telescope was launched towards another Lagrangian point about 1.2 million kilometers um, from Earth and beyond the moon. It's basically these points or areas where the Earth moon, gravity of the Earth moon system and the gravity of the sun are more or less in equilibrium. And it allows spacecraft to be placed in these positions where the sensitive sensitive instruments on board are not affected by um, heat radiation from the Earth or other, and, and they're in regions that um, are quite stable as well. So they need very little fuel to maintain their their orbit. Um, so what what we're actually seeing here is. Soho has a mask mounted on the stem. You can see the shadow of the stem just coming off the edge of the graphic towards the center. And there's a, a mask blocking the bright sun and that allows astronomers to see the prominences in corona um, around the sun and these events called coronal mass ejections. In fact, um, just Kind of wrote, beginning to rotate off the sun's disk at the moment are this very large sunspot group. Um, they named them Active Regions, and Active Region 2936 is roughly about 100,000 kilometers across, so many times wider than our Earth. And the sun is, is beginning to um, pick up its activity again as we head towards solar maximum in the year 2025. But the excitement this week was really around um, this coronal mass ejection because, because it was directed earthward, there was a very good chance of us seeing northern lights. Um, and there has been some observed in other countries, but not yet from Ireland as far as I know. But those two websites there, especially spaceweather.com, are worth keeping an eye on for potential alerts for any northern lights. And, and there's a couple of apps as well. Aurora Watch UK have an app as well as their own website. And then there's another one called Glendale app where people, when they see the Aurora, they contribute details of the sightings. So that allows you to um, kind of decide yourself whether it's worth going out to, to have a look. But it is one of nature's great events. But on to what's visible in the evening sky. Um, as, as Steve said a couple of days ago, or, or last night, in fact, the moon was just below Jupiter, and it would have moved on tonight a small bit. The moon moves about 25 times its diameter towards the left every evening, and gradually is growing from a very thin crescent to a slightly fatter crescent, and then will become first quarter or, or half phase, and then full moon in a couple of weeks' time. But Jupiter is really the only naked eye planet at the moment in the evening sky, and we lose it pretty quickly because it's slipping closer and closer to the solar glare with each passing evening. And by mid-month or so, it will become very difficult to see and we'll finally lose it around the 21st or so. But um, Jupiter, you can't fail to miss it. It's the brightest object in the evening sky in the southwest at the moment. And binoculars will show its four major moons changing position from night to night. The morning sky is, is really where the planets are gathering. And these mornings, as, as I'm 
leaving the house around 7.30. Um, as, as I'm heading over towards work, I, you can see Venus really quite prominent above the southeastern skyline. It, it's, it's, even though the sky is beginning to get bright, Venus is so brilliant. It, it just punches through the, the twilight and really dominates. And much fainter Mars is moving rapidly through Sagittarius at the moment. But in a few days time, um, in, in a week or so, you'll see um, both Mars, Venus and Mercury form quite a large triangle in the morning sky. Mercury um, was visible in the evening sky in January, then passed through what's called conjunction with the sun, where, where it passed between us and the sun, and has re-emerged into the morning sky. And, and it's beginning to just get a little higher with each passing day. But by the end of the third week of the month, we'll, it'll get low again and we'll lose it for, for another few weeks until it emerges in the evening sky later in the spring. When, when you see Mars around the 24th of February, um, within the same binocular field is the brightest asteroid. It, it was the fourth object discovered between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter back in the 19th century, in the early 19th century. And it has been visited by the Dawn spacecraft, which then went on to visit the asteroid Ceres. And it's the only asteroid that easily reaches naked eye visibility. Um, you'd need a pretty dark sky to see it though, but with binoculars from any location, you should easily spot it as a bright star-like object. And if, you're really lucky and you have a few clear mornings in a row. Um, if you spot a star that's moved, then it will be Vesta. Now Mars will move, but Mars is much brighter, so that, that's pretty obvious. But Vesta, um, if you have an app or this chart is from the Stellarium software, it, it will basically show its position from morning to morning in relation to the fixed background stars. So, so it's well worth going out and trying to track down Vesta. Uh, a few people managed to spot it last year when it, it was up in constellation Leo and it was near a reasonably bright star. And, and even just taking a photograph of the re that region of the sky, you, you should manage to pick up Vesta. Now, the thing is, is it, it, the sky will beginning be coming bright so you want to catch it before it gets too bright where it will just be swamped by twilight. Speaking of Leo, um, it, it's worth kind of seeking out the, the, the celestial lion. It's one of the few star groups that actually looks like what it's supposed to represent. In, in this case, it's a reclining lion and you're seeing the, the body of the lion, um, which its tail marked by the nebula. And then Regulus marks the, the, four, the four quarters of the lion, and there's the, the chest, head, mane, and head of the lion. In fact, that um, pattern is like a backward question mark, and, and it's very recognizable. And it's nicknamed the sickle, for, for obvious reasons. It, the mythology of Leo, um, it's, it's one of the ancient constellations and represents the, the lion, the Nemean lion that was slain by, Her slain by Hercules during one of his 12 labors. Now, some people have previously suggested that there's 12 zodiacal constellations and do all the zodiacal constellations represent the 12 labors of Hercules? Um, because Cancer, the crab, for example, and Hercules 
trod on the poor unfortunate crab at one stage during his struggle with the mythical hydra um, and Aquarius some people have suggested is where Hercules um, because Aquarius is portrayed as pouring out water some suggest is that the labor where Hercules had to basically clean the stables in one day and he diverted a river to, to clean out the stables. Unfortunately, nice as it would like to be, there, there's no um, cor correlation whatsoever because a number of the other groups, um, like many of those star groups were predate the Hercules myth. So it's it's highly unlikely there's any correlation, but but still it's it's a nice thought, and and we can only speculate what myths were back then in in relation to mod, our modern interpretation. Um, to actually find Leo, um, it's it's quite easy. It's coming up in the eastern sky these evenings. This this is a chart for the night of full moon later this month when the moon will actually be in the sickle of Leo and but it lies generally under the plow so when you see the plow coming up if you look to the the lower right you you'll easily find the constellation Leo and it's it's another star group um worth learning because it's in that direction of sky, um, we're, we're, we're kind of looking up and out of the plane of the Milky Way galaxy into the deeper universe beyond. And the whole region um, from the tail of Leo down into Virgo is, is called the realm of the galaxies. And we're, we're looking towards deeper space in that direction where in, instead of towards the bright lights of the Milky Way, as we do in the summer months. And just like I, I know Orla and the others will, will share this online, but this is a, just a calendar of events taking place over the month ahead. And there's quite a lot happening. Now, the, um, when, when I put the calendar together last December, there was a good chance of the first test flight taking place this month of the new um, space launch system, which is NASA's rocket to basically loft the um, Orion capsule and, and crew towards the moon and begin their return to the moon and construction of the next generation space station. Unfortunately, um, as with all uh, technology, there's been delays and it looks like the first launch will not take place until maybe April or even May this year. They, they're planning to start rollout and fueling of the rocket in March, but the opportunities for launch will not open until um, a couple of weeks in April and a couple of weeks in May. It's going to be an uncrewed launch. It's a test flight, but it will go around the moon. It will carry a number of um, satellites that it will deploy. But if this succeeds, then they're going to aim for astronauts on the moon, including the, the first female astronaut um, in about the year 2025. So, it's an exciting few years ahead in terms of um, space exploration. And the, um, I just have a few uh, links, the other links there, space weather, of course, uh, skymaps.com, where you can get a monthly chart, heavens above, and Universe Today has, has a lot of news online, and then stellarium.org, where you can download the free planetarium software from which all these charts are produced. Thanks very much, and clear skies. John, thank you very much. To see, can I stop share there? Perfect.
Thank you very much, John. Um, as ever, uh, lots to, to think about coming into uh, the next few weeks. Um, incidentally, uh, the, the chart that you showed of uh, the plough above um, uh, Leo the Lion, uh -huh. um, I had a, an American lady uh, explain to me that she always told people how to find Leo or told her grandchildren in particular when they were young, that if you were looking for Leo, imagine that the uh, saucepan of the, the plough, as you know, the Americans call the, the, the plough the dipper. If you imagine there was a hole in the bottom of the dipper or the plough and water was coming out, you were going to get a very annoyed Leo because he was right below it. So it's a, mm. it's a very handy way of uh, just locating it straight down through a hole in the pot. Mm. Um, it's a very good technique, yeah. One of the things that um, I just wanted to say uh, is it has been a delight uh, to have had so many speakers speak about so many different things uh, during our sessions here. Uh, but to see another generation uh, taking up the, uh, the torch, uh, albeit a, a darkened torch uh, in, in the dark sky, um, is brilliant. And uh, I really look forward to um, uh, our, our guest speakers today. Uh, and I will ask uh, Fidelma Butler to uh, introduce them. Fidelma, thank you very much also for joining us. Well, Sorry. hi there. Yeah, hi there and good evening, everyone. Um, what a great, uh, what a great talk, John. And it, it, you know, it really does make me appreciate, um, even where I live now out in the country, being able to, you know, being able to see some of those things that you're talking about. It's fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Madonna. Thank you. And so it gives all, you know, it also gives me pleasure now to introduce two amazing people that I recently met um, at the uh, BT Young Scientist exhibition um, and contest. And, you know, um, I suppose humans have been using the dark sky to navigate and using the, the, the stars to navigate for, you know, for, for many millennia. Um, but of course, they're not the, you know, we're not the only ones that use the dark sky to get around. And there are a range of species um, that use the night sky to, um, to, to move about. And uh, June Oak, or Jane Oakley, should I say, and Eric O'Brien are, are two students from Loretto School in Balbriggan. And they recently did their project and completed in the Young Scientist competition on, on a project that looks at the effect of artificial light on ant navigation, on the navigation of one species of ant. Um, and they did a fantastic project and came first in the biological sciences uh, senior, senior group, so that they achieved the, the prize for that, uh, which, which really, you know, up against some let Jane and Erica um, tell you about, about their project. So off you go, Erica and Jane. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Jane. Uh, I'm Erica, and I'm just going to get our presentation up here now for you one second. Yeah. Uh, there we go. That should be up now. Um, Um, so yeah, so as Fidelma said, our project was on a specific species of ant and how like pollution affected its navigation. Um, we chose Campanola sneakabrensis. It's a type of bamboo sugar ant that uh, is mainly found in Asia. Um, but the beginning of our project actually started when we found an article on dung beetles and how that affected their navigational systems. Um, we went from there trying to figure out what way we could turn this into another idea because the navigation of animals and how it's affected by light pollution is a very big um, issue that isn't looked on enough. Um, so we chose ants just due to um, our interest in seeing how it affected their foraging habits um, as that wasn't something that had been looked into yet. Um, ants are a very important part of the ecosystems being decomposers the ant population is larger than that of the human population. And if that was severely decreased, that could affect um, multiple things in our ecosystems and have catastrophic effects. 
so uh, light pollution can be very disrupted to these ecosystems due to the ants having a thing called a celestial compass. That means that they their sense of navigation is directed by the moon and stars light and how they find their way using that. So I'll give you on to Jane to talk a bit more about so, <laughs> so, so how we completed our project was we created a um, grid system uh, which was labeled 8F one um, on the X axis and one to 10 on the Y axis. And we had this underneath their outworld. So we set up a maze inside their outworld using Lego and we tried movements um, to and from the food, which was at the end of their maze. So we recorded them 24 hours a day. So we induced as little stress as possible. So we let them always had food in their maze so they could freely um, do their do it as they play, pleased. Um, we took down um, our results using record sheets. Um, so that's our um, setup there with our grid underneath it. And yeah, so these are our record sheets. Uh, we did nine diagrams of our outworld and we recorded down the date and time of the run. We took down the transit time, which was how long it took them to go to the food and back with um, discounting their eating time. We took, uh, and then in orange mark, we went to food and recorded their exact movement and then in purple marker the movement back so you can see an example of our control um our led and our sodium light so uh for we chose to do four analysis which was um their transit times the movement count to the mate to the food and the movement movement count from the food and um, specific routes. We split um, them into six specific routes and those were going to the food only. So for our specific route analysis, we put them in a stacked column chart, which you can see here. <laughs> um, so out of 30 runs, the control did it 29 times out of 30, which you can see here, and the LED flip into two and the sodium um, was quite erratic in its uh, choice of route. So we did that for our specific route data. And then with our other degree analysis, we completed uh, cruise Kyle Wallace tests. And then if um, our p-value fell under a certain alpha level of 0 0.05, we were able to complete Manwin EU tests so I'll leave you on to Erica to do this. Um, yeah, so for our results for our three different analysis, um, we, with our data ga gathered, we are able to state that um, for the movement count from the maze and for the transit times, the, both the LED and sodium had significant effects on our ants, but the sodium had the most severe effects. And then for the movement count to the food, um, we can state that both the LED and sodium did have significant effects, but we weren't able to state which was more severe just uh, due to one of our uh, results that we had not being significant. Um, and then it's just on to our conclusion. Uh, so uh, for throughout our project, for throughout the course of our project, we realized that there was multiple, uh, sorry, one second. There's, there was multiple, hold on one second now. There was multiple observations that could be made that uh, showed that light did have an effect on our ants, but uh, for our conclusion, we can state that they both had severe effects on our ants and just um, that can show you the drastic effects they did, they could have in the real world. Um, to further our project, we would like to investigate how um, they work in the real world, um, just having like a larger sample size for our ants and having um, them out in their natural habitat. We kept our habitat as natural as possible, but just like out in nature really would be the next step for us to go. Um, 
if I'll give you on to Jane then if she has anything else yeah so light pollution as um, a lot of people know is like a bad is a it's a very like important issue that is slowly being addressed but um, like with our research you can see how it affects um, even like such small things such as ants so with um, it affecting ants that could affect other be other species that use a celestial compass which um, moths um, different beetles and think and other like insects use so if it affects our ants in this way it could also have drastic effects on other animals and the ecosystem and things like this early doing more research um, that really leads to change within um, with for issues such as these so yeah that's pretty much um, it yeah so if anyone has any questions on it feel free to <laughs> yeah thank you so much for that Erica and Jane it was really really good um, I have a question. If anybody else wants to ask questions, you can pop them in the chat or you can raise a hand and we can unmute you if you actually want to ask yourself. Um, just a really simple one because I'm not a scientist, so sometimes the science goes over my head, but like there's been a lot of move towards LED lighting because it's seen as more sustainable almost. So yeah. would you say that it isn't? Or do you think your results would prove something that maybe LED isn't as good as we think it is? I think the LEDs are definitely better, uh, especially like the sodium light had like a lot more of a drastic effect um, on our, well, on our ants in particular. But um, yeah, so we, yeah, we really think the, uh, our LEDs are better but I think mm. if we kept doing research with different lights I'd say we could find possibly um, a better alternative but definitely changing to white LEDs is a step in the right direction but um, it's obviously not a complete solution because it's still um, like as our research shows has got a significant effect but it's definitely less drastic than like, you know, the more, the sodium lights, mm. which you can slowly see are getting replaced, which is good, but um, yeah. Yeah, definitely sustainability. It yeah. is a good option just as, um, it, as affecting like habitats and ecosystems and animals navigation. Um, it like, it's always worth to find other options that, could potentially be better but it's definitely a start for now. Hmm. I just I know uh, Steve and John have said before about you know and especially for the, the dark sky reserve uh, for the lighting there's specific um, restrictions or how would specifications is that how you would say it's uh, yeah. there are con constraints on uh, the fitting of lights the actual uh, simple things like uh, the planning permission around uh, lighting and lighting of public areas and a significant uh, activity around um, retrofitting to get rid of sodium lights in particular. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, and, and thank you very much girls, the, the, your findings reminded me of a talk I heard um, regarding uh, Mayfly and the impact uh, on um, uh, I think it was a German study. Uh, we had a speaker in up in Mayo at the European uh, the conference uh, held up in Mayo last November, 12 months, maybe with COVID, November to 48 months or there about 24 months. Um, and what they were talking about was that the Mayfly uh, are very clever. They, 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 they fly up this river to lay their eggs and they judge from the flow of the river where to lay their eggs so that the eggs come back to where they hatched. But that lighting bridges meant that they lost the, the ability to navigate because they were using moonlight, starlight to navigate and see the glow of the river. Uh, and then you put a big uh, bridge with piles of lighting on 
and they lose the river. So they lay the eggs not in the river as intended, but whatever. And also millions of them get killed on the on the bridges. Uh, and as a result of this research, a, a project that started pretty much as the girls did with their aunts, um, they came up with the, not a logical solution, which was to turn off the lights on the bridges. So the, the, the bridges are now lit for traffic on top. But this thing of uh, showing what a great architect you are by lighting up the bridge at night is something that uh, they, they've pulled back from. And I think uh, every, every little thing that we do in this space, we learn something else that uh, can, can help us understand just how important dark skies are. Yeah, can I just yeah, can I just um, add in there that uh, yes, the you know work like this really does show the importance of dark skies and the impact that light has and um, experimental work, you know, like the work that the the the, the girls have done um, shows you know we need more of that sort of experimental work really to pinpoint what these effects are, and of course there are many other animals that use the dark skies to navigate. Um, we like lights to, as, as Steve says, we need, we need lights to, to move around, but of course that, that, that's not the case for everything else, is it? Um, so, you know, as well as all of the, you know, the other issues that, that, that are facing all of the, the biodiversity at the moment, like all the climate driven issues, you know, things like this, like, like, like the impact of artificial lighting, really, you know, I guess it's only by work like this that we really will begin to see how much of an impact that also is having on our, on our biodiversity. So well done to the girls for, you know, taking, uh, taking an experimental approach um, in a very novel way, you know, um, to, to, to examine the impact of, of, of light like this. Right, so there's one or two questions um, in the chat, so I'll just read them out. Uh, we'll stay on ants for a few questions, and then I have one or two for John as well before we finish. So the first question is, where did you get the ants? Um, we got the ants, uh, so we got sent on like a wild goose chase trying to find our ants. Um, there was a few different websites that you're able to get ants off. Uh, ants Davy um, and Ants HQ. Um, they're both in the UK. Um, we ended up buying ours from Ants HQ because they were out of stock in Ants Davy. Um, but uh, they got here really quickly and everything was like completely up to standard and all the ants were okay and everything as well so um they're quite a good um one to use um the next one is if light is affecting the ants to such an extent do you think that there might be a knock-on effect from that on anything else that might uh need to use ants as a food source yeah yeah so ants are um ants are decomposers so a lot of um like microorganisms and like new and plants that rely on nutrients from the soil with like um the decomposed material and that um so if the ants say get slower and things like that with um the lights it could like leave them more open to predators which decreases the population which then in turn yeah would knock on have a knock-on effect to um like plants and like microorganisms that rely on yeah on them as a food source yeah and rely on their contribution nearly to um yeah to their food and that yeah mm. so because nothing's in isolation is it everything either is a food source for something else so yeah. if it affects one thing affects another yeah, um, it's kind of effect, yeah yeah so another one is uh, such a huge effect on one species would obviously imply similar problems for other species. One would think everything is linked, even when we don't know it. So yeah, exactly what you were yeah. saying there. Um, and then uh, a comment here from Gronia Motes. Congratulations, Erica and Jane, from one of your teachers who has joined us this evening. Thanks. Um, and I'll just check. Okay, I think that's that's uh, and questions for now. Um, I'm just going to pop back up and, and ask uh, John two questions, and then you can still add them to the chat if you if you want. Um, so John, um, just wondering what your thoughts are on the Chinese artificial sun. Yes, that that's the um, 
where I, I think they're they're planning to use uh, giant mirrors in orbit to basically beam sunlight during dark, well, dark times of the year. And it's, it's something that um, has been mooted for quite a few decades. Um, I know Russia um, back, I think in the early 1990s, they created, uh, they, they launched a small satellite and basically the, it, it unfurled then rather like flower petals and formed a mirror. And they basically orientated the satellite to reflect sunlight into regions of Siberia. And some people suggested it, it did work, but it, it, it was too small. It was really just a, a, a test bed for the technology. Now, of course, it, it's um, fun to have astronomers up in arms because it, you no longer have a, a dark night sky and they're already up in arms with the proliferation of the, the um, satellite mobile networks that are being put up by SpaceX, OneWeb and other consortiums. Um, and, and then there's the possibility of um, them may maybe in the near future doing that, but, but also um, various ideas have been mooted in the past to put advertising, illuminated advertising in orbit. So your favorite brand of uh, soft drink or, or that could be lit up in lights. And, and in with the Tokyo Olympics, there was uh, um, there's a group called, um, oh, I can't remember their name, but they're, they're a, a Japanese startup and they were launching a satellite with various um, capsules on it, colored capsules. And basically they were going to create a, an artificial meteor shower for the opening ceremony for the Tokyo Olympics. But again, it was a challenging technology and they um, haven't quite got there yet, but they do hope to do it in the near future and on demand for various events and create artificial and colored meteor showers. So um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, the sky is the next um, kind of, area where there's going to be lots of debate. And of course, there, there is um, space law as a whole industry in its own right, like as, mm. as to like who who controls the skies. Or, like it, it's, it's basically a free for all at times, but, but they might at some point in, instigate some controls. I suppose it's, they'll uh, have to at some point, will they? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, a technology that has been used in a minor way. In, uh, uh, there's a town of, in Norway. Corona, uh, Corona Vara. Rundjegnen, I think, is there, uh, where uh, the, the town was built in a valley. Uh, the reason it was built was because there was plenty of supply of uh, water, uh, electricity from a... Um, uh, uh, a very large uh, waterfall, but uh, it, it didn't get sun. So the solution, it didn't get sun because it was so deep in the valley that the sun never got down into the valley. So uh, they put a mirror on the top of one side of the valley to redirect the sun. And I'm sure if you were a resident suddenly having sunlight when you hadn't had it uh, throughout your life uh, in, in the summer months, was a nice thing to have, but one just wonders what it did to the local environment in terms of uh, the, the the animal life. And this was um, this was hailed as a a, a great thing, um, but I think we're a little bit more educated these days in terms of uh, uh, the 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 wider impacts of such activity. And uh, one would hope that the Chinese don't get to build their sun. Yeah, and that and that's and that's kind of where 
it, it is going to be a big debate about the needs of like society versus um, like the effects on the environment and and like certainly like Elon Musk's Starlink system is is bringing telecommunications to inaccessible areas, so it, it's very difficult to argue against that. Mm. And his his um, space rubbish on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> it was not something else that came out last week. Um, so we have another ant question. I'm just going to slip back into the ants. Um, if you've got to run the experiment over many generations, do you think there might be behavioral adaptations within the population or eventual, eventual decline and extinction of the population in that site? I think if we were to run the project on such a scale like that over generations, there definitely would be a decrease in the amount of ants. That, like, I don't think it would lead to possible extinction, but I do think it would severely decrease the amount of ants we would have. Yeah. Um, and over possibly, time, I'd say eventually they would um, adapt maybe a bit just to like not go extinct. <laughs> But because um, ants like forage in a specific way, like once they deem a root safe, they'll continue using that root. So I'd say they'll form over time, like over like generations. It like they may form a new like habit and pattern and that like um due to them being slower and things like that due to the like effect and things but um i wouldn't say extinction but there would i'd say definitely probably be a de decline in the population but um wouldn't go as far as extinction hopefully mm -hmm. anyway <laughs> and you actually mentioned it earlier on it would be really interesting to do like a larger sample and also in their natural habitat as well so are you going to continue Looking at ants, is that going to be next year's BT scientist entry? Um, currently, we're uh, working on a project for John Hooper. Uh, it's a statistics competition to see. Um, so we've stopped subjecting the ants to the lights currently, and we're going to okay. see if their behavior patterns go back to what they should have been before ha before we subjected them to the lights, um, just to see if the damage is reversible. Um, if we took away the light pollution, what would happen sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, we're doing that anyways, first step and then we'll take it from there. The, um, can I just ask a question that, that, that occurred to me? Um, what happens to the, or what potential impact is on the ecological system in Balbriggan to, to the release of your ants if they, it's... We're we're not going to be releasing our ants. <laughs> uh, they're they're definitely an invasive species to the area, area yeah, we're in. Yeah. We're not going to be releasing them out into the wild. Um, currently, they're up in our labs. They're staying there for the future that we can see anyway. Enjoy, um, yeah, enjoying we'll life. Be, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, that works for sure. Yeah. Living the good life on free food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The poor little Asian ants would probably get a terrible shock, I think, if they were left out now into the into the climate here. <laughs> They're currently in like 25 degree, like on heat mats, so they would get very cold. Yeah. Yeah, sure shock, they would. Say, yeah. Fascinating. Thank you so much, guys. It's really, Thank you really so much. good. And um, we do try to keep within the hour. So I just have one very last question. And apologies if I've missed any. Um, you know, we do go through the chat. So if there's anything that we might have missed, um, we can add it into our email when we send out an email next week. So I'll do this one to Steve. Um, as a tourist planning a trip there in March, is there information regarding where to go, how to get there without sweeping stargazers with headlights? Oh, very good question. Um, the uh, we on on uh, the Kerry Tourism uh, or Kerry Dark Sky Tourism website, uh, there's detail of uh, various accommodation providers. Um, uh, so there's, there's plenty of information there. Getting here pretty much straightforward. Uh, 
head south from uh, from uh, Killarney along the Ring of Kerry roads, and you're going to hit uh, South Kerry eventually. Um, the Dark Sky Reserve covers just about uh, 700, uh, uh, 700 uh, square kilometres, so uh, there's plenty of scope. And um, in in terms of where to, to stargaze, I always suggest beach car parks. They have two major advantages. The first is uh, you can get to them easy. They're flat uh, and safe underfoot. Uh, but more interestingly, uh, stargazing to the sound of uh, the sea is particularly gorgeous. And uh, it also has one major other advantage, especially in the summer months. Uh, you don't get uh, midges down by the beach uh, as much as you do in other locations. But um, we will be doing talks right through to June. And... Um, if you keep uh, an eye on the website, we're going to have some more detail about now that COVID is uh, on the way, some of the actual physical outreach things that we'll be doing, not only in, in, in Balanced Skellings in my area, but in other areas uh, around the Dark Sky Reserve. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right, so just one very, very last thing is, um, so the live project are collaborating with Steve, uh, the Kerry Dark Sky Tourism, and then we're also collaborating with a number of other local organisations and individuals to um, put on a very last minute Dark Sky Festival <laughs> at the beginning of March. Um, I will be sending out links to that. We're hoping to release a programme within the next week. So there's just a range of um, sky, stars and nature themed events and workshops all happening in South Kerry in the Dark Kerry Dark Sky Reserve. So we will send out some information about that as well. And uh, sorry, John, did you want to say something? Oh, well, I, I've replied to Ben's other question on the chat there. Oh, sorry, did I miss one? There's, it's hard It's hard to keep track of them, especially when there's lovely comments coming in as well. Oh, sorry, and, and I, I actually sent it to um, to the hosts rather than uh, rather than to Ben. Sorry, I mean, it was it was about coronal mass ejections. Were they random or they um, were were they predictable? But mostly random. But they they have worked um, on predicting them because they can observe developing sunspot groups and judge their how active they are and whether they'll release flares but, but in in terms of predicting them um, the likes of soho and there's another spacecraft called ace are like one million kilometers closer to the sun than us so when the char the cloud of charged particles washes over their sensors they can um, give a couple of hours alert to space weather forecasters on the ground and that can allow power companies and that to um, take like mitigate against overload of transformers stuff like that but, but space weather is a, a huge area Thank you. Well, just a final thank you to Steve and John for uh, joining us every month. We absolutely love listening in to their words of wisdom. <laughs> and uh, special thanks to Jane and Erica for joining us. It's been an absolute delight to listen to you. And to Fidelma Butler as well. Thank you, everybody. It's been lovely yeah, to have thank, you. Very thanks, enjoyable. Orla, and Lucy and Claude. Thank you for the, the organising. Or as ever. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks. And thanks for joining us. And yeah. thanks again, girls. Yeah. Girls, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.